Follow along as we build a fitting tribute to the Land Rover Defender. This series is brought to you by LR Centre Limited and Frost Auto Restorers. And SIP Industrial Products. Welcome back to Fun Rover TV and our tribute build. This week we've been stripping the seam sealer from the bulkhead. Very laborious, but that means that can go off to the galvanizers soon. Then we've been fitting this fuel filter housing. The old one corroded and so I bought a new replacement, did a troll the back of it and then fitted it up with these bolts here. There's two holes in the side of this cross member. That's a nice easy job. Then we fitted a panard rod. Now if you ever wonder what it does, here is the side to side movement without the panard rod fitted. Now that translates that movement into an up and down movement as you can see here, which gives you obviously improved handling without it car would be undrivable. So, fit up this bracket first. That fixes on with these half inch UNF bolts and nuts. Then the panard rod itself can be offered up. I'm going to adjust this later on, but for now we'll fit it. So I had to tap it in with a hammer and then adjust the uh, hole using a screwdriver, which I'll show you in a second. Tap the bolt through, and then nips that up just loosely for now. Then offered it up to the bracket we just fitted. Again, using a, a hammer carefully. You then use a screwdriver, you can align the bolt hole so that your bolt just slips on through. Then I went ahead and torqued those up. Then the cross rod eye needs to go into the cross rod or the steering arm you'd probably call it. This is left hand thread. So it actually fastens up by going counter clockwise. And you'll see why that is uh, set up like that because when you adjust it and you twist the steering arm then both sides extend or retract together so you just put that in place there's some castellated nuts that need to go on there and split pins but I'm just offering it up loosely for the time being so that I can fit the steering damper this is a heavy duty old man emu one which I actually had to do a little bit of modification to on the race of the bush at the bottom I had to do a bit of filing to get it in but anyway, then I could use a drift just to lightly tap it in. It's a very snug fit, which it should be, so there's no play. So got that lined up and then added this, which is an M10 bolt. Goes through there, I've got some copper slip on or lithium grease as we've been using from Gwyn Lewis. Tap that in place. You can fasten it up on the back, just shown there. You also need to offer it up to the chassis through there, so get your washers and bushes in the right order. Moving on to the brake calipers, we were shot blasting the old ones, but you know what, we're running out of time. So the easiest way to get them out is using an air compressor through one of the brake line ports. Uh, be careful, they pop out with such tremendous force, they can actually go flying 30, 40 foot sometimes because of the pressure that builds up behind them. Now, splitting brake calipers is not recommended by us, by any brake manufacturer. Uh, the reason we're doing this is because it does make swapping pistons a lot easier. So, if you're going to do this, which we don't recommend, but obviously we are doing it, you need a very, very clean surface to work on. If you get any dirt or anything in the seal or in the brake line itself, it could cause a failure or a leak, which means pressure drop, which means less effective brakes. So that's why it's not recommended. However, it does make swapping pistons and also the seals that go around those so much easier. So, if you do this, it's of your own volition. There's no torque setting for those bolts because this is not something that any brake manufacturer recommend. Here are the stainless steel pistons. We're fitting these because we do such little mileage that they often corrode, so the stainless steel ones should prevent that. Okay, now we're using some red rubber grease. This is for the seals mainly, but it does mean your, your piston will slide in a lot easier and it should prevent some of the hydroscopic action of the brake fluid where it absorbs water, so it should prevent water ingress. Once you've got it in, you can just press it in with your fingers usually if it's quite loose, or in this case, I just did it with the, the vise very lightly. And then you repeat that for all the other pistons. Then following the workshop manual, we'll refit these with the bleed nipple at the top. The bolts that go through here are bihexagonal, so you'll need bihexagonal sockets. We're using a, a 10 half inch socket set, which works really well for this. Now for a blast from the past, for me anyway, because I used to work at a spray shop, we're gonna paint the wheels. This is one of my most favorite things to do, working on 
Land Rover's painting, it's great fun. So I've got everything set up on a table on top of some uh, paint cans that are masked off so I can spin the wheels around. And we're keying up the surface, we're abrading it with a scotch bright pad. This is a red scotch bright pad which I think is equivalent of about 320, 400 grit which is just about perfect for solid colours, solid paint colours. So I'm keying off the surface, taking off that shine because anywhere that's shiny will, your paint's very likely to not stick. So take your time doing this, hit every surface with the scotch bright pad and then when you're done you can have a lot of dust. Quite a lot of it's from the scotch bright pad itself so I'll, hit, I'll take the airline and blow away the dust, get rid of all that and inspect it one last time before hitting it with some pre-wipe degreaser and also a tack cloth after that. As this is a single pack product we can just use a carbon filter air mask and gloves and I'm using some proper mixing beakers because these make the mixing up of paint and measuring out so much easier. We recommended to use about 10 to 15 percent thinners for this paint but because it's so cold I've had to just add and uh, do it to suit. So um, using the xylene thinners there I'm mixing it all with some proper paint mixing sticks and these are all very cheap we found on eBay they're called tongue depressors as well. Don't get air in your paint, you want to mix it thoroughly but not froth it up. Then decant it into your HVLP gun, although you can use this paint to roll it or a brush. Once I'm happy with that, and I did have to add more thinners because it's so cold, even though I've heated the workshop with a space heater, can get on painting. And you can see I'm grabbing my airline so it doesn't drag through my wheel which has wet paint on. This is just a thin coat first, we'll add a medium wet coat after this coat has flashed off. In between the flashing off of coats, I'm using a space heater to bring up the ambient temperature because paint really should be applied. The lowest temperature is around five or eight degrees for most paints. And ideally it'd be at 20. So I've managed to get the workshop up to a 15, which is much better than the cold temperature we would have been working with. This stops it blooming and gives you a good finish. Now, as you can see, I was able to turn it around using my paint can, which is brilliant. So without having to move around. I'm releasing the trigger at the end of each pass because that helps keep the pressure in the gun consistent. And as you can see, the color hasn't come out quite right in the camera, but the paint finish is flawless. There's not a single piece of debris, dirt or trash in those. And I'm gonna leave those to cure for a couple of weeks actually before I take them to a wheel fitting place. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Funrover TV. You can see our last episode here and also check us out on funrover.com. We are at Funrover on Twitter and Instagram and we're also on Facebook.